This is One on One. Hi, I'm Steve Adabau. Welcome to the WNET Tisch studio here in the heart of Manhattan, Lincoln Center. I want to introduce Erin Burnett. We know her from CNN. She is on every night on uh, Out Front. But you've had a fascinating career in broadcasting, right? It's been an amazing ride, I have to say. Not a career I expected to be in. I mean, I think, think there were certain pieces of my past that made it clear this is what you should do. So I, I, I found the right thing for me. What were you but going I had to no do? Idea. What were you going to do? Well, you know, I, when I was young, I thought I would be an archaeologist. And then I wanted to be in the CIA and the Secret Service, or, you know, I wanted to go in the Foreign <laughs> Service. I'm sorry. And then I thought maybe I'd go to law school, and I ended up doing broadcast journalism. <laughs> it's interesting, but you had some, uh, some background down on Wall Street. You mm -hmm. learned high finance deals. I mean, you know, I was I was an analyst. I came out of college and, and went and worked on Wall Street. And right. I basically it was the schedule, um, you know, before they started giving people these hours now, you know, where they say yes. you have to have a certain amount of rest. And I did. I worked <laughs> before that time. So it was 20 hour days and you're putting together books and basically working for clients. On, I worked for Ralph Lauren when they bought Club Monaco and doing all the background research, flying up to Toronto to do due diligence. A junior analyst job where I learned the nitty gritty of numbers. OK, so. What happens where all of a sudden the broadcast world opens up to you? Do you go to people on TV or do they come to you and say, hey, we think you would be great on television. What happened? That did not, it did not happen that way for me. Why did that well, happen? you know, what happened for me was it was one night, I'll remember it, um, a client that I was working at, was some, it was a healthcare company. And I'd been up all night working on, on some pitch book. And my brother and my brother-in-law and my sister said, hey, you got to look at this article on the front page of the business section of the New York Times. And there was a picture of Willow Bay, who was leaving oh, yes. um, her job. She was at ABC. She was going to go to CNN to be uh, the anchor of Moneyline, which was a business show they were going to do. And they said, you got, you know, this would be, you should, you should, you should write her. And meanwhile, the reason they, they picked her was because when I was a, a little kid growing up in the middle of nowhere, we got the New York Times once a week, and she was the model for Estee Lauder back then. So Where'd her you picture was Eastern Shore of Maryland. Okay. Farm there. So her picture was always in there, and so I knew who she was. So then all of a sudden, this person I'd watched growing up, the model for Estee Lauder, gets this job as the anchor of Moneyline, and they say, you got to write her a letter and tell her about how you've been following her career. I said, you know, I'm going to write her a letter. So I wrote her a letter, and that's how I got into broadcast. What? She writes back? She, had, she, she was looking for a new assistant, and her assistant called me. Um, and said, why don't you come in and meet with her assistant actually kind of scoured through the letters. And my letter was sort of a random letter. It was, well, first of all, kind of like a stalker, right? <laughs> so I used to watch you and, you know, there was that aspect to it. And then there was the, you know, I, I, I mean, I guess in my heart of hearts, I was thinking, oh, maybe something would come of this, but it right. wasn't, I didn't ask specifically for a job. But the assistant said, you know what? I want to replace myself. I want to go do something else and, and had me come assistant, in. the assistant, then you get on the air. And it took, I'm, it wasn't quite that yeah, easy, but uh, th that's how it started. Yeah. And Willow has still been a mentor to me after all these years. So, so you, you got the CNBC thing going that goes, you know, then you, because you got the Today Show, you're doing a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, the Today Show. Yeah. Uh, you got the Morning Joe thing. You made some news there. I saw some YouTube stuff there that was oh, fascinating. I'm sure, I'm sure it was fascinating. But it's not hard to find. <laughs> Check it out, folks. Um, and then the yeah. CNN thing, thing happens. Um, is it, when you're out there, in an comp incredibly competitive marketplace, how much pressure is there, from your perspective, to bring in, let's just put it this way, the numbers constantly? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much of an obsession about I mean, we're in PBS. I'd like to say numbers don't matter, but our great president, Neil Shapiro, WNET, it matters, but it matters in a different way. Right. right? How much does it matter? You know, it, look, this is, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, I think, first of all, the thing about CNN and why I love CNN is it is CNN, okay? It's about doing the news. It's about covering the world. It's you, when you do a big story on Al-Qaeda in Northern Mali, like we went and did, you can actually influence what politicians are talking about. And that's the power of it and the amazing thing about it. Right. People turn to CNN when there is a story to be told. They come to CNN. Now, when there isn't a story to be told, the big existential challenge for CNN is, well, how do you get people to keep coming on those times, right? How do you get that regular day in and day out? And that's where the numbers challenge comes. When there's breaking news, everybody comes to CNN. Numbers are huge. When there isn't breaking news, it's a different story. So I think, in a sense, yes, they, just like you said here, they matter, but they don't matter. But of course, there's pressure and stress. Everybody feels it. And you're frustrated. You put an amazing show on the air, and if it doesn't do, doesn't do a great number, you go, yeah, I'm really frustrated about that, of course. But you know what? I just find it interesting because, because I've done your show several times. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting to me is, and this is no disrespect to the other, uh, there are two other stations. You ever hear about them? 
Uh, I'm, I'm familiar maybe with their yeah, name. They're, they're, they're out there. my memory, yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> some would argue that, hey, one station leans a certain way, the other station leans a certain way. <clears throat> People could have their own view on this stuff. But the one thing I always noticed that at CNN, every time I've come on um, to do analysis, there is no point of view per se. Meaning, right. you're not saying, I mean, I come on with a point of view. I was on with Paul Begala. He always has a point of view. Right. Analysts and contributors, commentators always have a point of view. The right. station doesn't have a point of view, does not have a point of view. Have you ever sensed that there's a point of view? You know, everybody has a point of view. No, that the station stories. has a point of view. Well, I mean, as the station, as an overall thing, no. But do individuals at, at, at our station or any station, people have points of view that come across? Yes. I mean, we're all, we're all people. But I think of it this way. If you say there's a game, right, and the yes. game is, say, a game of politics, it's a football game, I like to think of it as, you know, basically we're the commentator of that game. So when somebody throws a horrible pass or does a horrible move, you say, you know what, that was bad, and that didn't make sense, and that was terrible. And that doesn't mean that you're saying you're taking a point of view on the overall game. It doesn't mean you're choosing a team, right. but you're going to call the play-by-play. -play. And I think that's part of what, um, you know, an impartial news network needs to do. You can't just pretend there's always two equal sides to every play, because there aren't. Sometimes you call it the way you see it. You call it the way you see it, so, and that so, needs to be. So sometimes that is "quote unquote" taking a side because one person's okay. going to like the call and one isn't, right? But I'm going to give you an example. Yeah. One night uh, I'm there and I'm in the green room and you've got um, what's the guy's name? Yeah, Ted Nugent. So oh, yeah, yeah Ted you know Nugent. the interview, yes, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So I get off the segment. We have a nice segment. Well, I forget what we were talking about. But then I'm there because you're on with, with Nugent and I'm saying I'm fascinated by this because he says some things about the president. Mm-hmm that are pretty, let's just say, out there. Yep. You challenge him. He says what he says, you keep challenging him. Mm -hmm. But you're not challenging him because you have any, have any particular point of view about the president or Democrats or anything, or Republicans. Right. You're challenging him on what he said. That's right. I mean, and to me, that's because in the case of what Ted Nugent had said in that time, it was inappropriate for anyone to say. But if he said it about George Bush, you would have done the same thing. Yes. But the fact that he has such a following and is a very influential person for a lot of people is why that is an interview that to, to, out to my mind and to my boss's mind at CNN, it was worth doing. Some people would say, well, someone calls someone a horrible name. Why are you even going to talk to them about it? And in many cases, the answer may be, well, you wouldn't. But in some cases, you do because the person influences of what a lot of other people think or perhaps reflects what other people think. And people want to know, why, why did this person say that? I mean, this person should apologize, yeah. which Ted Nugent did. He, he apologized. Did. It's interesting. What we're talking about, Google this one, too, because Ted Nugent called the president some pretty horrific names. Yeah. Aaron challenged him, and I believe what he said is, my family's been telling me I have to stop calling people names. I think he said, I'm 66. You're supposed to learn a long time ago you don't call people names. That's uh, right. That's not a, a PBS point of view politically. It's just you don't call people names. We don't do that. Right. That being said, I'm fascinated by the idea, the idea of you've done documentaries. Mm -hmm. You're in studio to do what you do, but you've done documentaries. Biggest difference. You know, the thing about documentaries is it gives you a chance to really delve into an investigative story or, or a, a story that you just care about passionately. And I love that. I mean, it's one of the things about journalism. I know, you know, you, you we've talked about this. Um, one of the things that we're, we work on things have to do a lot with national security. Um, you know, we went over to the border of northern Mali when, mm. when the al-Qaeda story there was rising. By the way, a story that continues to be a huge story. And we were able to do a lot of reporting there. And that, to me, is kind of the, the great nexus. You, it's Only CNN can do that. And only in the, in the context, and we did our live show from there, but we've been able to do a, a considerable reporting since then because we were able to go do that and tell that story. The sort of we can go there when you're with CNN, and I think that's a, that's a big part of it. We did a documentary on Benghazi, yes, which continues to be a very real and serious question, and politically it's going to probably be important in 2016, certainly depending who runs. It's interesting. You've pressed that more than a lot of people, but you press it, from my perspective, because you believe that that is an important set of issues that we need to understand more about in terms of what happened, mm -hmm. who was accountable, who did what, who didn't do what, Right. but you couldn't care less about who gets the credit, who gets the blame. That's right. And that's the frustration that I have with it, is that some of the people out there are asking real questions, but they're doing it with a political slant, right? Assuming uh, that there was, you know, some sort of nefarious intent and or you don't. cover up. You don't. No. You just want to know. No, but there were mistakes made. Clearly. And there are people that need to be held accountable, and no one has yet been held accountable for doing that. And those things need to be addressed and are very fair questions. In the time I have left, I'm curious about this. Um, juggling. Mm -hmm. um, one time, I remember coming on the set and you were just getting off the phone. And if, I don't, I don't want to give away too much. Yeah. You were giving direction 
I'm not sure to whom, but you, you have a young child. Yep. And you juggle. Fair to say? Yeah, and I'm just learning it. It's my first child. I'm yeah. learning it. But, you know, someone said to me, a really good friend of my mother's, who uh, um, incidentally just gave me this beautiful painting of my parents' house. And they're getting ready to, to move out of this house. So it's a special thing that she gave. And she said, you've got to, you know, this is this painting. And you can tell your son about this place that you grew up that was so special. Your son was born in late 2013. Yeah, he was born right. in the, November 29th. Right. And, um, and she said, you know, just because having a child is common does not mean it is not unique and thrilling. And that's mm. something that, you know, before I was a parent, I didn't realize. And, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is a great joy. But, I mean, I'm very blessed to have the job that I have and be able to make it work so far. I don't know how. I would imagine going from one to two is sort of exponentially more challenging. But, but so far, it's working. But it is time management. It is It's time constant time, man time management. It is. Yes, well, that's the hard part. But I kind of am of the school of the more things you have to manage, the better you do. The more Why balls you have in the air. I don't know. If you only have, like, one thing to do during the day, you can make it take the whole day. But if you have 14 things to do, you get them all done. Okay, before I let you out of here. With all the folks, uh, again, with all the technology we have around us, um, with our iPads, with our smartphones, with everything we have around us, you see the future of television news slash cable news, news from the traditional broadcast platform mm -hmm. being? I know it's a ridiculously massive question. Gosh, I don't, I, I can't pretend I know the answer, but I think obviously it does include all of the, the apps and the, the fact that people can contribute themselves and can watch themselves. Twitter and that, that instantaneous, first of all, discovery of what's happening, but also input from people in the center of stories. I think that changes it forever. I do think, though, there will always be the need, even if temporarily it's not appreciated, for a what people would say is a traditional news platform. But by that, I don't mean how it's delivered. Right. I mean how it's curated. That you want to know that this has been checked, that this is real, that this has been verified. Because it's very easy to have innuendo and all kinds of rumors, right? And But I think that, that people want the truth and that knowing what's the truth is frankly a time-consuming mm. and expensive proposition, and that's never going to change. So I don't know how it's going to be delivered. I don't pretend to be any, you know, have any insight on that. But I do believe in the actual product itself. See, you could have gone a whole bunch of other ways. Would you say uh, paleontology? No, you could have. Archaeology. <laughs> I, listen, I don't know the difference, but I'm glad you chose the path. You <laughs> Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it was great to be here, Steve. Appreciate it. This is Steve Adubato. More importantly, Aaron Burnett's uh, been with us. Check her out uh, on CNN. And uh, we'll be back from the Tisch WNET studios right here in the heart of Manhattan. Be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by. Hackensack University Health Network, County College of Morris, PSE&G, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Wells Fargo, Celgene Corporation, and by Kessler Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.